So last time we were talking about consequentialism and um, the view that consequences are essentially what determines the rightness of an action or the wrongness of an action. And consequentialism, as because of that view of, of consequences being all important, regarding the ends as justifying the means, and that being one of the reasons that Christians historically have tended to have some suspicion with regard to consequentialism. Well, this week we are, especially uh, on Thursday, going to be talking about deontology, according to which the end definitely does not justify the means. And it's really conformity to law or principle that determines rightness. And you know, given the centrality of law within Christian ethics, there is a little bit more of an affinity with uh, deontological thinking, but Christian ethical reflection has been very, very different from Kantian deontology. And Kantian deontology is usually what we think of when we think of deontology. So we'll spend some time with Kant on Thursday to try to un unpack some of that. So, but just in a nutshell, Kant tries to derive the content of morality from the very idea of a law. Christian ethics um, tends, has tended to think about the moral law in terms of God's will or God's law. Right? So not deriving the content of the law from the idea of the law, but rather thinking in terms of what is God's will? Well, what is right and wrong must somehow be connected to God's will or, or, or God's vision for the world, right? God's intentions for the world. But of course, the question of how we know this, how we know what God's will or what God's intention, what God's plan is for the world, is a very complex matter. And so there's been lots of intense Christian ethical reflection on law, not in the Kantian vein, right? Not trying to... to um, deduce through pure reason, pure practical reason, the content of the moral law, but thinking about the kind of messy complexity of all of our beliefs about what's right and wrong and trying to relate that to what uh, God's will and God's intention might be. So today we're, we're focused on Christian uh, reflection about law and in particular two core thinkers, uh, Aquinas, uh, and Calvin, whose understanding of the law has been seen to be very, very different from one another. I'm going to be arguing for an interpretation on which they're much closer to one another. And this is built on some um, past couple decades of research that's really recovering uh, the, the affinities here. But let's start a little bit closer to the present. Um, might think that, oh, this is really not the way Christians think anymore. Um, one one towering example, one, well not, one pervasive example, let's say, of Christian ethical reflection that is rooted in the notion of law, and in particular the natural law, and we're talking about all the different kinds of law that Christians have, have differentiated among, but the natural law has been really central in Catholic moral theology. Can anyone think of an example of, of a place where Catholic, I know, I know you have very different ex experiences of Catholic moral theology, but any area in which you think of Catholic moral theology in connection with reflection on natural law. So um, how, how does that go? Obviously, we're not reading that, in the, reading that uh, discourse in this class, but the, the rough outline of that reflection would be um, the natural purpose of the sexual act is to lead to the conception of new life, and we shouldn't be interfering with what's natural and that would be going against the natural law. Therefore, we must not engage in contraception. Yeah, in a nutshell, yes, it's, it's more elaborate and so on. But in general, we see in the modern period, Catholic moral theology appealing very often to natural law reflection, re appealing very, very often to the notion of what's natural and what's unnatural, particularly in the areas of sexual uh, ethics, uh, and part of what I want to bring out today is the, the many ways in which that's kind of a departure from the main line of, of historical reflection on natural law, which hasn't really been obsessed with sexual uh, ethics in that way, but also hasn't, and maybe more importantly, also hasn't reflected on nature in that way, uh, on the way certain bodily parts are somehow intended by nature to fit together, and therefore that tells us what we can and cannot do. 
with them. But obviously up here, I have a different example of appeal to natural, uh, natural law. How many, I, I'm assuming that um, probably everyone has read or heard Letter from a Birmingham Jail, okay. All right, much more familiar than Catholic moral theology. <laughs> so this is a famous quote from, from that uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. You, you might or might not, when you think about that letter, um, think about um, the reference here that to Thomas Aquinas. It's kind of an interesting fact um, that, that it's in there. But just invite you to read that quote to yourself and then think about what work this is doing for Martin Luther King Jr. What is the significance here of invoking the law of God, the moral law, the natural law, and so on? Any thoughts? What, what, what's the significance of arguing in this way? So if we figure out that a law, if we figure out, right, that's, there's the if there, that a law is unjust, then it's not a law at all. So there's an authorization to disobey certain laws. Important move to make, right, when people are calling for law and order, right? Law and order in an unjust society. Oh, God, but the laws are on the books. You got to, you got to obey the laws. Any other thoughts about how this is functioning? The thing that I want to come back to is the fact that Martin Luther King is not just, it's not, he's not innovating uh, in appealing to natural law in order to advance this social justice argument. That is something that had been done, had been done by African American thinkers long before him. Uh, and so there's alongside what we may maybe, maybe first think of the kind of conservative Catholic sexual ethics of natural law, there is a black natural law tradition of social justice. And Martin Luther King is not the first, he's kind of the inheritor of a long line of thinking along that. So keep that all, you know, keep that all simmering as we, as we uh, turn back in the tradition. So this is, some, this is connecting to some of the things that we talked about early on in the semester, but you know, Christians have grasped and honored the centrality of law in the Hebrew Bible, have understood it not as a powerful ruler issuing laws that we have to obey because a powerful ruler has issued them, but rather in terms of covenant, right? So God isn't a tyrant who's coercing people into obedience, but the, the law is inviting people into a covenantal relationship with God. And the law enables people to live well. It enables people to live in peace with one another and, and with God. So yes, law requires obedience, but the obedience is directed toward genuine freedom and genuine flourishing. And as we've said, Christians distinguished among ceremonial, judicial, and moral law within the Hebrew Bible, understood the moral laws continuing to bind Christians and as summar summarized in the Decalogue. Jesus is understood as inaugurating a new covenant or a renewal of the covenant, bringing forgiveness and grace, but the new covenant has its law as well, the twofold love commandment, which is a not a displacement of the Decalogue, but a summing up of the Decalogue. And all law is oriented toward love, toward loving relation, toward friendship, friendship with God and one another. And we understand that love toward which we're invited through Jesus' teaching, through Jesus' life, through Jesus' boundary crossing, hospitality, Jesus' crucifixion, and, uh, and, and resurrection. So here again, the commandment of Jesus isn't arbitrary or coercive or dominating. It's not the law of a tyrant that imposes on us. It's enabling and empowering. It frees one. It points to what a flourishing life is like. So today we're focused on the place of law and the moral thought of Aquinas, John, Thomas Aquinas and John Calvin. And I have to begin by issuing a major caveat that while law is 
plays an important role in the ethical reflection of both, it's by no means all uh, or the full picture of Christian ethics for either of these thinkers. So we want to be asking, what work is this idea doing for them? Can we consult the natural law in order to find out what to do? If not, why do we talk about the natural law? And we begin with Aquinas. So Aquinas's Summa Theologiae really was a textbook of theology uh, made for those who were going to become priests. It is um, three big, big uh, 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 volumes, but it's unfinished. So it was 512 questions, and that's still not completed. And the reason I point this out is because only 18 of these 512 questions are on law. So if you want to get a sense of like how important is law for Thomas Aquinas, given that Catholic moral theology, Thomas Aquinas is the person you turn to as a source for this legal reflection. It's 18 questions out of 512. So soon after he wrote it, it was lifted out of the whole summa as a treatise on law, and it became like a self-standing thing, and you could just study that. But it wasn't intended to be a separate treatise at all. He employs for the whole summa a cosmic frame, the exodus and the reditus of creation. So this is a Neoplatonic notion ultimately that creation issues from God and then in some way returns to God and the fulfillment of God's plan. For, the, for a, a, a pagan Neo, Neoplatonist, this is a notion that, that creation just kind of overflows from God. But for Christians, this wasn't an unintentional thing. This was um, an intentional divine action, an expression of God's love. God creates for a purpose. God creates in order to share the love that is God's life with God's creatures. And God's creatures are then invited into friendship with God. And Aquinas saw human beings as playing a, an important role in the realization of this divine purpose for creation. And we see that kind of in a nutshell in this quote that talks about how he's, okay, I've, I've, I've been writing this summa, I've been talking about God, I've been talking about creation, of all the things that came, came uh, forth in accordance with God's will, and now I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna treat God's image, that is, I'm gonna now talk about humankind. Uh, and humankind are also, he says, the principle of their actions. They have free will and they have control of their actions. So he sees all of creation as imaging God in some way, but human beings image God in the particular way of being moral agents, of being capable of intentional action, of being capable of being responsible for what we do. We can reflect, is this a good way to act? Is this not a good way to act? And when we make that decision, then we're responsible for what we have done. This means that human beings can cooperate intentionally with God's plan or cannot cooperate with God's plan, can attempt to understand what God's purposes are and cooperate with them or not. And God's intention ultimately, according to this view, is friendship. Um, friendship has to be accepted by the friend. And so again, he sees human beings as these intentional agents capable of accepting God's offer of friendship. Now, he certainly thinks that finite fallen humanity can do this only with the assistance of grace. So grace is offered through Jesus who institutes the church and the sacraments as means of grace so this really offers the whole structure of the Summa, beginning with God and creation, turning to the analysis of human, humankind, the human, and uh, an analysis of human action, human virtues and vices, and then turning to, okay, we can't do this by ourselves, even though this is our role within God's plan, so we need Jesus, we need the sacraments, we need the church. So, that's the big picture of the Summa. And then like, where are these questions on law? How do they fit into this big picture? Well, law is sandwiched between an initial general discussion of habits, virtues, and vices, and then a more lengthy discussion of all the individual virtues and vices. So for Aquinas, we can say law is subordinated to the virtues. And we'll say more about this next week when we turn to discussing the virtues. We're not reading Aquinas then, but just, you know, we'll have a sense for 
how the big picture, how, this, how virtue and law fit together. So law, he says, is an extrinsic principle of human action. It works on human action from outside. And virtues, instead, are intrinsic principles from within our character and intention. So what's the idea here? Well, in general, what he thinks is that when you're guided by law, you're moved by somebody else's grasp of what is good and worth doing. And when you're moved by the virtues, you're guided by your own grasp of what is worth doing. He actually thinks that there are two extrinsic principles that God uses to move human beings toward the good. One is law and the other is grace. So they're both working on, on us through God's understanding of what is good for us. Law instructs us, he says, and grace assists us. So on his view, law is not just coercing us to act according to what God wants. Law is also forming us. Law forms us in virtue. It's not the only way that virtue forms, but it's one of the important ways in his view that we form the virtues. Aquinas has things to say about human law, too, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but it's always in relationship to God and God's law guiding us to our end. We're moral agents. We have our own intentions. We move ourselves. So how can we be moved to act in ways that are in accordance with God's plan for creation? It's not a, it's not a done deal, right, because we, we, we could do all sorts of things. So God has, has um, law and grace in order to assist us in moving in this direction. Here's just the, all the different kinds of law. I'm gonna go through and discuss each of them um, in, in, a, in, a, in a bit of detail, some more and some less. But the, the point here is he thinks of law in a cosmically comprehensive way. He has an account of law that can bridge everything from the laws of physics to you know, don't drive on the left-hand side of the road. So how do you come up with a conception of law that can actually do, hold all of those things together? So in question 90, he's really working toward an overarching definition of law that can hold all these, these things together. And where he ends up is with this notion that law is an ordinance of reason, it's for the common good, is made by one who has care of the community, and it's promulgated. So those are the, the uh, four components here. And there's a, really want to underscore here, there's a striking emphasis on reason, right? Not on the will and command of a superior. It's not just good enough to, to, to be in that position of power and authority and issue a, issue a, a command. Law is, there, 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 he, he cites the notion that law is whatsoever pleaseth the sovereign. A very popular medieval notion of law, right? You're a king, you issue a law, you it's whatever you want, whatever's good for you, right? And he's pushing back against that and he's saying, no, law directs toward the good, toward the common good. So there's an emphasis here on reason rather than will, on the good rather than just the desire of the sovereign. So the first um, and most fundamental form of law is the eternal law, what he calls the eternal law. And he sees this as operative throughout the universe, throughout creation. It's built into physical objects and the way they behave. So, you know, stones dropping, <laughs> gravity, that's eternal law. It's also built into the instincts according to which animals behave. Birds building a nest at a certain height off the ground, he sees that as an expression of eternal law as well. So he thinks of everything in creation as having natural inclinations to behave in certain ways, and he sees those as the eternal law um, imprinted on these beings. But he thinks that human beings need law in an additional way to guide our reflections about the good, because again, we're moral agents, so we have to actually decide how to act. We have to think about what's, what's good and bad. And sometimes what we think is good is only apparently good, and sometimes we fail to see that something is more worthy of pursuit under the certain circumstances. So eternal law just is divine wisdom. It's the divine um, kind of blueprint for creation, one could say. And all other law, in order to count as law, has to be in harmony with the eternal law. 
in harmony with his divine wisdom. Now, the, just backing up to the definition of law for a second, okay, it, ordinance of reason made for the, for the common good, made by the one who has care of the community, all of that seems to fit with eternal law, but what about this promulgation business, making it known? How, how is the eternal law made known? Uh, it seems to be just this kind of there, that's it. Well, he, um, he, he suggests that, well, rocks and birds can't know the, can't know the law per se, but he argues it's promulgated by being inscribed in their natures. So there's no need to know it. They, they just act according to it. So there's a kind of a perfect conformity to the eternal law in, in non-human nature. So human beings are, we're, we're subject to the eternal law. That is, if you throw me off a tower, I will fall down, just like the stone, right? So there's a sense in which eternal law operates just fine in human beings. But we are all also capable of another layer, another, yeah, another layer of participation in the eternal law, which he calls the natural law. And he thinks that the natural law, this is a little bit maybe not what we'd expect. We'd think, well, the natural law must apply to all natural things. But he thinks of the natural law as the rational creature's participation in the eternal law. So the, it's, a, it's a way of participating in the eternal law that's open to those creatures that are moral agents that are capable of critical reflection and standing back and making, making uh, decisions for which we're responsible. So he puts it this way, that among all other creatures, the rational creature is subject to divine providence in the most excellent way insofar as it partakes of a share of providence. So we're kind of providential for ourselves. We have to, we have to actually spend some time thinking about, well, should I do this or that? Is this really the best thing to pursue in these circumstances, is this the apparent good? That also means, of course, we can fail to be provident for ourselves and others. We can sin or we can just make mistakes. We can conceive of something that is uh, worthy of pursuit and be wrong about that. So our participation in the natural law is a mixed bag. Right? It uh, makes possible good and evil. Well, there's also human law, right? If you're going to give a cosmically comprehensive account of law, human law has to fit in here some, somewhere. Uh, but here we get this idea that, again, to count as law, it's got to accord with that definition of the law. It also has to be um, ordering action to the common good. It has to be made by someone who has proper authority to care for the community in question, and it's got to be promulgated. So. An unjust law, something that, say, enriches the sovereign at, at the expense of all the people, is not truly a law, and Aquinas just says that straight out. A sovereign also can't bind the members of a different community. Right? Sovereigns have, yes, human sovereigns have jurisdiction that's limited. God's jurisdiction is unlimited, but human sovereigns can't just like go off and you know, make laws for you know, what's got going on in, in the other side of the planet. And a law that has not been made known, has not been promulgated, can't bind either. So not good enough to kind of, we, we can't do what God can do in terms of inscribing law on the very natures of creatures. So we actually have to make it known. And it has to be consistent with the eternal law. But what does it mean to be consistent with the eternal law? He certainly thinks that human law supplements the eternal law by specifying things further. There's all sorts of things that human, human societies come up with. Human societies create social institutions. Social institutions need laws in order to be directed toward the common good. And so we need laws that specify which side of the road we're going to drive on, drive on. We need laws to regulate the banking industry. Before there's a banking industry, you don't need those laws. right? So he thinks of them as not, not present in the eternal law, but as consistent with the eternal law if they're just. Some, of, some human law he thinks of as reiterating the eternal law, or reiterating the natural law, and assigning penalties and constraints that are needed to shape us into greater virtue, shape us into greater <laughs> adherence to God's um, direction toward the good. But human laws shouldn't try to prohibit all evils. He's very clear that human law should be modest in what it sets out to do, 
there are sometimes prohibitions that would require so much coercion that it'd be better to put up with the not so good stuff because you're gonna do worse by, um, by trying to, to eradicate it. Uh, people, people ought to worship God, for example, but being coerced to worship God doesn't even result in real worship. So that is not something that human law should be directly involved in. All right, so divine law. Divine law is revealed law. You think, well, eternal law is divine law. Yes, but he uses this term divine law to talk about the revealed. So if natural law is the human participation in the eternal law, it's pretty limited. Our grasp of God's eternal law is uh, muddy, let's say, and human sin interferes with our grasp of it. It also interferes with our capacity to act according to it. So revealed law provides guidance in the midst of this uncertainty. So in theory, human reason would be capable of knowing the Decalogue, for example. Remember Romans, too. The law is written on the hearts of the people. So you don't actually have to have it be revealed. But God republishes it through revelation. So this revealed law provides a standard for human law. So human law, you can, the, the human sovereign is in some sense always trying to ask, well, is what, I'm, is what I'm issuing in conformity with the eternal law? But that's a hard, hard question to answer. So... Let me ask a question of whether it's in harmony with the revealed law. The divine law forbids things that humanly made law would do better not to. The divine law can, doesn't have to deal with the problem of, of uh, creating more evils by prohibiting than you actually take care of. Uh, and I, I believe an example of uh, something human law, well, I, I, I won't go in there. But <laughs> so divine law can prohibit all evils. God, is the, God, God doesn't have to deal with either the lack of certainty about what to prohibit, but also the, the downsides of prohibiting and trying to enforce certain things. But it also goes beyond human law, humanly made law, in that it guides to an end beyond the earthly common good. So here Aquinas thinks that human reason can, can grasp that the happy life is the well-lived life, the happy life is a life in which we're all kind of cooperating toward the common good. And he thinks that human reason can even grasp that the well-lived life is, or the happy life is a life in which God is loved and all of creation is loved in relationship to God. He thinks that that He's less skeptical than we are now today. He thinks that natural reason can understand that God exists and God is to be worshipped and we would live in harmony with one another in worshipping God. But he doesn't think that without revelation we can grasp that the well-lived life is revealed in Jesus Christ. That we can grasp that the, well, that, 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 that the uh, well-lived life or is the life uh, lived ultimately uh, that takes one to the cross. A life of forgiveness. So there are things in which we, things that we must learn from divine revelation. And then there's this um, new law. The new law is the we've talked about this: the twofold love commandment: love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That is a restatement of the old law, but he says something very interesting about it. It's not just a restatement of the old law. Okay, we got the Decalogue once. We didn't do a very good job of living up to it. We get Jesus' restatement of the new law. It boils it down. It's even simpler. It's like, okay, we don't need even 10. Let's get it down to two. We'll be in good shape. But he says something more than that. New law is principally the grace of the Holy Spirit, which is given to those with faith in Christ. So there's a kind of odd thought here, which is that the new law is grace. We think of law as kind of telling us what to do, law is constraining us, and here he's kind of turning that around, the law is grace. The law, if, if all law is intended to kind of support us, direct us to the good, grace does that in an especially powerful way in terms of 
changing us inwardly so that we can be directed toward the end that God is holding out to us. All right, back to the natural law for a moment. So in the early natural, early, early uh, modern period, this whole idea of natural law evolved into something quite a lot more ambitious. The idea was that maybe if we just analyze human nature empirically, we can deduce from it action-guiding moral principles. Right? We can figure out theologically what does God want given like, oh, we are social creatures, but we fight with one another. Okay, what does that mean in terms of what kinds of principles must be in accordance with the natural law? So Aquinas sees the natural law as directing human beings to fulfill their natural inclinations in ways that are suitable to the kind of creatures we are, which is creatures who have to reflect on what to do. We are moral agents. But he doesn't see it as a deductive enterprise, and he certainly doesn't think that it's deduced from some kind of objective empirical description of human nature. You don't just like go out and do, do a study of human nature and then say, okay, let's figure out what the principles are that, that fall out from that. So human nature is a normative concept. It's understood in terms of God's plan for human beings. Not where we are now. That's not human nature ultimately, but where we're headed, what God intends for us. So when it comes to like talking about the natural law, he doesn't try to provide a comprehensive list of natural inclinations and then say, okay, if we follow one of these natural inclinations, we're in good shape. This is how we arrive at all the principles of natural law. What he does is um, kind of he's echoing the Stoics who had identified these sort of three tiers of natural inclinations. So he, he's not investing a lot of time and effort in this. It's sort of, oh yeah, we know these are kind of natural inclinations of different sorts. So the first tier is common to all created substances, animate, inanimate. Right? All created things try to preserve themselves. And of course, the trying is not the way that we would use the word trying, uh, but it's just that this is how they act. They act in ways that, that tend to preserve themselves. And then there's another tier, and this is a tier of inclinations common to all animals. All animals seek to kind of perpetuate themselves. And so he names sexual intercourse and education of offspring. But really what he's thinking of is how it is that animals perpetuate themselves over the generations. And then there's this other, t the, uh, the third tier is inclinations that are special to rational creatures, special that is to moral agents, special to the kind of creature that has to reflect on what to do. And here what he names is um, uh, seeking truth concerning God and seeking life in society. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So f I want to talk about um, the first precept of the natural law. Now it sounds like, okay, now we're getting down to serious business. We're going to get precepts. They're, they're coming from, from an observation of human nature, and then we'll know what to do. And here we get this precept. Good is to be done and pursued, and evil is to be avoided. Well, thank you. <laughs> Good, now I know what to do. Uh, so people have really puzzled over this. What, what, what is going on here? This is not action guiding, obviously. The first question is going to be, okay, so what really is good and what isn't good? And um, So it's really just a general statement about what it is to be a moral agent capable of acting in accordance with one's own assessment of what's genuinely good and choiceworthy, and it sends us back to the hard work of figuring out, okay, I guess I should seek what is genuinely good, and I should avoid what is genuinely evil, and I need to figure out what that is. So if you go back to these inclinations and the three tiers of inclinations, seek the preservation of your own being, but do it in a way that's suitable to being the kind of creature that you are, this creature that reflects and that is capable of being uh, providential for one's own being and the being of others. Seek sexual intercourse and education of offspring, but in a way suitable 
to the kind of creature that you are that reflects on what is good. Seek the truth of God. Seek life in society. And again, do this as, as rational creatures, as moral agents. So why this pairing, though? Truth concerning God and life in society. Again, this is all just very, very summary. This is not intended to be a comprehensive list. But we could say that following Aristotle, we're social, we're political animals, we live in societies. And knowledge of God is a knowledge of a trinity that provides a model for loving society, for friendship. So there's a way of understanding these two as deeply connected with one another as opposed to just, okay, random thing. Rational creatures, hmm, I guess we try to know the truth and we try to, <laughs> we try to uh, know God. So bottom line here, he's not trying to draw up a list of primary and secondary precepts of the natural law that would be action guiding, that would settle our moral disagreements, that would tell us what to do. Practical reason, reason about how to live and how to act is concerned with contingent matters. It can't have the kind of necessity or certainty of mathematical knowledge. What's just under one set of circumstances is not just under another set of circumstances. And practical reason has to, has to attend to those differences, has to attend to particulars and not just rely on general principles. So it's not, not that um, we have no need for general principles. He thinks the Decalogue is a great set of general principles. But there's going to be a lot of work involved in applying those general principles. He says, for instance, that the um, general principles of the natural law, some of them are self-evident only to the wise. So there's a self-evidence to them, right? There's a sense in which reason can grasp them, but eh, we look around and we say, well, it's actually only the wise that grasp them in their self-evidence. So the natural law, the whole idea of the natural law is not a shortcut to resolving moral disagreement. And he's not, he's not primarily engaging in this whole lavish description of cosmic law, eternal, natural, divine, and human in order to settle disagreements like that. Unfortunately, that's often how the natural law has been invoked uh, since then. Uh, shortcut, settle, settle the argument. Good moral judgment requires having good character, requires having a well-formed character that sees reality and all of its complexity well and makes good judgments. The way we even see is dependent on the, how we've been formed. And that's going to depend not just on us as individuals, it's going to depend on the social structures that we inhabit. You can inhabit social, a social structure that's going to deeply warp your whole vision of reality. So as we turn to talking about the virtues, next week we'll be able to dive into that. But that's not foreign to Aquinas. As I said, you know, massive amounts of the Summa are devoted to talking about the virtues. And this tiny part is devoted to thinking about law. So Aquinas um, certainly acknowledged the way that sin in particular limited our understanding of revelation um, and the natural law and limited our ability to follow law, God's law revealed and natural. But with the Protestant Reformation, we get an, an, you know, an underscoring of human fallenness, human sinfulness. So how does this transform the understanding of law, the understanding of revealed and natural law. Anyone want to venture, you know, you may have knowledge, but even without knowledge, just based on the notion that we get an accentuation of human fallenness with the Reformation, how might that inflect this picture of the relationship between eternal law, divine law, revealed, natural law? You know, certainly Luther is well known for emphasizing that the law convicts us of our sinfulness, that the drives us to God's grace. We just recognize how, how you know, abysmal we are, and then we, our, our dramatic need to be saved from our sinfulness. And in fact, of course, it goes so far as, as to raise concerns about antinomianism. That, that is the idea that Christians don't need any law at all. 
you know, because the, all the law does is condemn, and we're, we, we, we go from law to grace, and then grace is all we need. And Christians then will freely, transformed by grace, Christians will freely do what the law requires, just out of love of God and neighbor. We don't need law anymore. We don't need to be coerced into obedience. And at some level, Aquinas would agree with this, that when you're transformed by the virtues, it's easy and pleasant to do what is good. But there's a kind of big butt that's hanging over this in terms of, of who gets transformed uh, and to what degree to be able to be acting uh, spontaneously in this way. The interesting thing is that actually uh, both Lutheran and Reformed thinkers continue to embrace together with Catholics a very similar doctrine concerning the natural law. So one would have expected, and this was in fact um, the view for some time, when it would, that, that natural law would really get thrown under the bus. It's like, we just can't engage in that kind of reflection because we're fallen. And the function of law is really just to drive us away from law and in, into grace. So Calvin um, sees magistrates as tasked with supplementing the revealed law in ways that guide a community. And how do you do that? Is that okay? Well, yes, he thinks it's okay. Because what, what, you, what, what is uh, happening here is a traditional understanding of how human law has to harmonize with the eternal law, has to harmonize with the natural law, but is going to build on it in ways that serve the needs of particular communities. If you look at what Calvin actually says about natural law, he invokes it at various points, um, sometimes with a great deal of ambiguity. So he thinks that, for instance, it couldn't be completely wiped out. The kind of natural knowledge of good and evil was not completely wiped out at the fall. In fact, look at the second quote here. There's nothing more common for a man to be sufficiently instructed in a right standard of conduct by natural law. No, that's... That's a very traditional view. So people know what to do according to natural law. They can grasp it, but this doesn't extend to knowledge of God. So there's sort of enough knowledge for civic virtue. Um, Calvin and many Reformed thinkers had a great deal of respect for pagan, um, for pagan societies that had been regulated, they thought, in ways that conduced to civic virtue. And they were willing to actually emulate a lot of that in the ordering of civic society. But there's a caveat, right? Man's keenness of mind is mere blindness as far as the knowledge of God is concerned. So it doesn't extend to knowledge of God's desire to extend salvation to humankind. And then sometimes he makes it sound as though the primary purpose of natural law is just to convict. And again, that would be you're convicted by the natural law. We know it. We know it. We can grasp it. We haven't lost our ability to know what's good, but we know it only well enough to be, to be convicted by it. What we see evolving in Calvin, Calvinist Reformed thought, and then also with somewhat different vocabulary, often a different ordering, is the notion of three uses of the law. So we have the idea that law controls the sinful, that law turns sinners toward grace, but then this third notion that the law also guides the development of righteousness, or, or the third use of the law is sanctification. Luther um, is at least explicit about this. Melanchthon was very explicit about insisting on this third use of the law. If we look beyond the initial generation of the reformers, natural law discourse remains very important for the development of international law. How, what do you do when you, when you have these different nation states and they don't know, they don't even, um, you know, even just if you're only looking at the European world, um, they no longer are looking to the Pope as a shared authority. How do you live together? How do you govern your affairs? Well, the idea was that you could draw on natural law, 
So again, a lot of pressure to make natural law do some work if you're going to use it to, to, uh, to um, deal with international affairs. Natural law was very explicitly used to defend European colonization and slavery. It was also used explicitly to condemn European colonization and slavery. So again, natural law is an idea, but to actually engage in the ethical reflection, you've got to get down to the brass tacks. You've got to get down to the particulars of ethical reflection. The idea of natural law doesn't resolve that. So there are two mistakes. Well, there's probably many, many more mistakes, but to highlight two mistakes that crop up often in thinking about natural law in particular, and one is to, to assume that it's an inherently conservative idea, and again, I think that may be a tendency in our cultural context where it's associated with traditional forms of Roman Catholic sexual ethics, to see it as like holding on to, you know, the, we're gonna use nature to uh, somehow justify a teaching of, an, you know, a teaching of, of a body that claims authority, and it's gonna be their way of imposing it on everyone else by saying that it is natural, or by saying that it is rational, um, but in fact, the idea of the natural law has functioned in many, many different respects. Uh, and Martin Luther King is a, is a great example here. And, and in fact, wanted to point out that James Pennington is a very explicit inheritor of reformed reflection on the natural law. Uh, and it, it, we've got some documents of Pennington's available around here and you can see him invoking the natural law in his arguments um, against slavery. But then the second, I think, mistake is this just a desire to see natural law as offering a shortcut. That if we can just figure out um, the principles of the natural law, we can deduce from them something that will make it easier for us to arrive at moral agreement. Um, it, what does Aquinas think his, all his talk about law is doing, it's providing a framework of reflection upon which you can pull together everything from the laws of physics to driving on the right side of the road and make it coherently relate to one another. But it's not solving the nitty gritty. That's not gonna tell you which side of the road to, to drive on. And it's actually not gonna, in and of itself, deal, uh, settle any difficult questions.